you know, you're talking about how you get that sense of place, that feeling of place. And um, you're from Nashville, Tennessee, right. originally. You spent some time in Kentucky. Yeah, well, to school in Kentucky. My family is from uh, the Knoxville, Memphis area. And that's another place that just has you know, soul. I mean, it's, right. got, it's got flavor. Is that sort of, I mean, obviously you can't always pick this, but mm -hmm. is there any desire on your part to ever get to draw something set in Tennessee and go back to home and, you know, expel is this loaded, all those demons? Is this a loaded question? Do you know this from research? No. Nope. You're not leading me? I'm actually not re leading you. Okay, well, this is amazing because I'm working on this thing called the Loudermilk Brothers. Okay. The Loudermilk Brothers is set in 1956 in Franklin, Tennessee. All right. And uh, it's a psychic powers at TFA people. <laughs> right. Shop there. They know what you want before you even go in the store. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they. Uh, uh, so the Loudermilk Brothers is set in 1956 in Tennessee. It's about a couple of singing preacher brothers fighting for control of the church that their family founded. Nice. And it's. I don't know if you've ever seen Ten Men. Oh yeah. Ten Men, by some accident, has become a big influence on me in the writing of this thing. As I'm kind of conceptualizing, it's getting more vicious and more outlandish. But at the same time, they become very successful as a singing act, as a singing act. And the thing that makes them so successful is their harmony. So they hate each other, they hate each other, but the only thing keeping them alive is this harmony singing act. So there's an inherent tension. Uh, the main thing that I'm interested in, maybe not the main thing, a thing I'm very interested in, is making, um, making that sense of 1956 Tennessee come out. The same way that Portland things are going Because my mother is religious. My, not, not intensely religious, but you're Methodist. You can't be intensely Methodist. <laughs> but, uh, but I grew up religious and resisted it the entire time. And intensely resisted it. This is all bullshit, you know, I said. Um, now I'm older and I'm finding aspects of, of the social qualities of the religion that really valuable. Yeah. And that's that's a total side issue from the um, from the spiritual quality that I that I'm questioning as I age and so forth. You know, in a way, I don't know if I even this is going sort of way off topic, but I don't even know if you have to know whether you believe in God to get some value out of going to church. At the same time, you have this group of bigoted idiots over here, the Westboro Baptist Church, protesting gay people. Funerals, right. and you know, spreading these horrible messages of intolerance and so forth. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the nexus of that, and how, how something so intentionally inclusive becomes exclusive and, and perverse and uh, dangerous. The way that relates to a small town in Tennessee is if you go to Franklin, Tennessee today, there's a section called Five Points. If you stand there and turn around, you can see like five huge churches within a block of each other. Right. And I started thinking about the way in which church used to be the defining um, the defining social structure for a small town. Um, even, even growing up outside of Nashville when I was a kid, you would meet someone new and you'd be like, oh, my, what's your name? My name's Matt. And they'd say, my name's Andrew. And you'd go, what church you go to? Right. And even then. And um, I think my, my thesis is that all changed throughout middle America when television and rock and roll when pop culture really exploded and wasn't theater, which you have to go to, but when it could be brought to your house in a way, in a visual, uh, lusty way. You know, you can listen to a radio show about a beautiful bop ba boom woman, but you can't see her. Right. But if you see, you know, whatever, Jane Mansfield on your television, and she's actually in your home, sure. that, that changes things. And I think what it did was, it made it so that instead of talking to people that you live down the street from about the sermon that you heard last Sunday, you're then talking to people that you live down the street from about what happened on whatever yesterday, on the Ed Sullivan show yesterday. And in doing that, you're sharing something not only with the people down the street from the city, but the people in Los Angeles and the people in New York. And it created this, I don't know the 
dissemination, this diasporization, I don't know what the word is, of American culture that I think is both beautiful and that I can find out that something's happening right now. I mean, you can find it out on your phone right away. Sure. But it also diminished the sense of identity. And I, I think one of the things about America, this, I've gone into a thesis statement, uh, one of the things about America that is both intensely unhealthy and also incredibly exciting is that we don't have personal identity. It's so much bound up in what we export to the world and what we purchase. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else. And I'm fascinated by the ways in which that loss of identity also reflects a spiritual crisis. And to sum up, I'm not even sure I believe in God. And that's what I want to explore in my comic book about Nashville and Franklin, Tennessee in 1956. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that especially in the time you're setting with the advent of rock and roll and right. television and such, I, I am assuming from some of this conversation that that's going to play into some of the crisis between the brothers. Yes? Well, uh, in a sense. Um, What's essentially going to happen is that this this church is falling apart. We have two character, two main characters. There's Richard Loudermilk or Dick Loudermilk, and his brother Henry Loudermilk. Henry's been running the church. He's the younger brother. He's been running the church for ten years because Dick has been gone. It's not clear where he's been. And he comes back and he wants his share of the family thing. And in the mean, in the intervening ten years, Henry's running things to the ground. So Dick determines to take it over, but Henry's not ready to give it up, and they wind up performing to try and bring some people in. My phone keeps telling me that I'm supposed to be here for this meeting, <laughs> for this meeting. Uh, and uh, it's done a good job. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's letting me know. And uh, so, um, in making this music, it starts to become very popular, and a local television station picks it up. need to be made to make it more and more popular. Starting with, and this happened, this was something that happened with Elvis, starting with asking the brothers to dye their hair black with the photographs better black and white. But all of a sudden, you know, that does something to your authenticity as a person. You know, changes you. The message starts being lost to the medium. I think so. I think that's what it's going to wind up questioning. And whether... You know, I mean, then you get into the whole McLuhan thing, and the medium is the message, and blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, and that may be in there. One of the things about the way I write, and one of the reasons I write really fast, or incredibly slowly, there's no in-between, is that these things percolate and percolate and distort and tangle, and until they're really ready, it just I can't seem to force it out. And then I'll write, like Big Light and Tiago, the first half of that in two days. Is, are, is the lot of my brothers, is this like a fully one-man show labor of love? Are you writing, drawing, and everything? Are you working with anyone? That's the, the idea, is that it would be just, well, the comic book would be. Now here's, you asked earlier about all those different artistic disciplines, and here's what that comes. There will most likely be, and I don't know if this would be through a, a website or what, there will be a way that you can get you know, historically unavailable recordings of the Loudermilk Brothers. Recently unearthed, you know, Super 8 footage of the Loudermilk Brothers. And uh, so there will be, there will be audio, there should be some film. Uh, I have a friend named Dusty who made my film with me. And I think we're going to perform a show as the Loudermilk Brothers in the middle of their big meltdown, you know, which will inform the comic but won't be a performance of the comic. It'll be a sort of a lost scene performed live.